wanted to make a quick correction. I said something about C.J. Miller, a black man who got lynched in Kentucky. Um, I said uh, something that wasn't in that was inaccurate about him, so I wanted to clear that up. So C.J. Miller is actually just a, a a man that had been taken from a different city. I think Missouri. Uh, Sykeston, Missouri, right? So there's a there's a rape and a murder. There's the bodies of Mary and Ruby Ray of Bardwell were found uh, July 5th, 1893. And um, there's a... Uh, they couldn't find the man. In fact, the guy thought it was a white guy or a light-skinned black person. Uh, and they find this, this dark-skinned black person who's in Missouri and they bring him in there and his name is C.J. Miller. And he even writes... This long letter, he says, My name is C.J. Miller. I'm from Springfield, Illinois. My wife lives at 716 uh, North 2nd Street. I'm here among you today. Looked upon as one of the most brutal men before the people. I stand here surrounded by men who are excited, men who are not willing to let the law take its course. And as far as the crime is concerned, I committed no crime. And certainly no crime gross enough to deprive me of my life and liberty to walk upon the green earth. Leaders of the mob sent a telegram to the police chief of Springfield to verify Miller's statement. Several hours later, a message returned saying that Miller did not leave live in Springfield, and that was enough. Um, he even urged the mob to compare the blood found on his knife and his hand with that of the dead girls, but the report was never made public. And, um, and so instead of actually burning him, since they didn't know what was up, they, they hung him. So, how they hung him is this. I'm just going to say the whole thing. There was a loud yell and a rush was made for the prisoner. He was stripped naked, his clothes literally torn from his body, and his shirt was tied around his loins. Someone declared the rope was a white man's death, and a log chain, nearly 100 feet in length, weighing over 100 pounds, was placed around Miller's neck and body, and he was led and dragged through the streets of the village in that condition, followed by thousands of people. He fainted from exhaustion several times, but was supported to the platform where they first intended on burning him. Something interesting that I had listened to this preacher, it talked about those who had been lynched are actually the modern day Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was, you know, um, uh, uh, misunderstood and he was said to do all these horrible things and then he's put to death for it. Here, this man, C.J. Miller, is being paraded all around the, the town. You know, he's basically naked, right? They said that he just had a, um, uh, a, a shirt around his loins. And... Um, and, and then he's fainting, right? So that reminds me of like Jesus fainting and falling down. So the chain was hooked around his neck. The, a man climbed the telegraph pole, and the other end of the chain was passed up to him, made fast to the cross arm. Others brought a long forked stick, which Miller was made to straddle. By this means, he was raised several feet from the ground and then let fall. The first fall broke his neck, but he was raised in this way and let fall a second time. Never, numberless shots were fired into the dangling body. So they basically hung him twice, and then they shoot several times into his body. Um, and for most of the crowd was heavily armed and been drinking all night. So it's basically just a bunch of drunk, you know, assholes with uh, guns. And then C.J. Miller's body hung, thus exposed from 3 to 5 o'clock, during which time several photographs of him as he hung dangling at the end of the chain were taken and his toes and fingers were cut off. His body was taken down and placed on the platform. The torch applied, and in a few moments there was nothing left of C.J. Miller save a few bones and ashes. Now, I confused his story with that of Katie Anderson, okay? And Katie Anderson, she had said, um, Katie Anderson's story is the one that reminded me of To Kill a Mockingbird. This is where Daddy told me to say it, and you know, what are you, or no, no, in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, she was like, they kept asking her a bunch of questions, and she's contradicting herself, and she's like, well, I'm just going to say this, and then I ain't going to say no more, right? But she's clearly lying, and then the poor guy winds up getting um, convicted of it, and then um, he gets scared, even though there was going to be an appeal. And then uh, he he runs off, and then they kill him. Um, so that was that was Katie Anderson and Bob Harper. So I had mixed that case up with uh, C.J. Miller's case. So this is the Bob Harper case on Katie Anderson. Katie Anderson said that she had got raped. Nobody even knows if that's even true um, as of now. And then later on, once he was killed, she was like, "Oh, I'm so glad that that he was that he was killed." One more that I'm going to mention is the William Tyler case. Uh, he was accused of raping Anna Campbell, and the father of Anna Campbell comes to William Tyler and says, "You know, I'm going to kill you." And then William Tyler says, "Oh, but I didn't do anything. I'm innocent of this. I'm not guilty." And Anna Campbell responded, "Well, yes, you are. My little girl said you did, and that's all that was necessary for William Tyler to be murdered." Uh, just because Anna Campbell said that it was him that had raped her. And that was all that was necessary. As soon as a white woman says 
somebody is guilty of something, you know, of such a, cr a crime of rape, they're listened to, they're heard out, and, you know, it's incredible. It's just incredible. And um, I, it's, it's horrible to actually live through a lot of some of this stuff. But um, at Spalding University, Terry Shoon, she was sitting there telling me do this and do that. And, you know, I was in her office uh, working on a project that I hadn't um, completed. And when she was doing that, ordering me around like, you know, a little dog, like a slave, she kept touching my leg. And that was disgusting and gross. And I told um, the dean, Richard Hudson, this. I told Elizabeth Rogers this. I told several of them this. And nobody gave a shit shit nobody gave a damn like who gives a shit you got you know uh, uh, felt up on you were sexually harassed you were you know I don't want to say molested because it was just my leg but it felt gross and uncomfortable it was disgusting same thing also happened to me in the uh, Louisville jail in the Louisville jail they touched you know my my taint and my you know the chode or whatever um, and and also around my butthole and that was um, for no apparent reason, no apparent reason, really. Um, they were just a bunch of assholes, and I was talking to my friend, and then they started making fun of me, and they was like, hey, what are you doing? And I said, I'm talking. What are you doing? He said, he's working. I was like, looks like you're just sitting there. You ain't working. And then he got up, and then he went ahead and molested me. And nobody gave a shit. Nobody cared. And, in fact, a white, uh, a jury made up of all white women uh, had convicted me of menacing when I was guilty of none of them. They were the one menacing. They're the one that was disorderly conduct. They tried to run me over. And since they put four charges on me when I was just walking to the store and I was crossing the road, and that's that's it. There was doing nothing. There was absolutely I was crossing the road legally, so there was absolutely nothing that I was doing. Um, but since they put all the charges on me, if I'm to be as ridiculous as they were, then I would say that that was attempted vehicular manslaughter, right? They tried to run me over with their car, and they said, get the fuck out of the way, and I didn't jump out of the way immediately, and then they spun the car around, and then they stopped right in front of me, and they jumped out the car, right? They jumped right out of the car right into my face. That's menacing. That was terrifying. It was disorderly. It wasn't professional. That was unmarked. You had no idea that there was a police officer. He had a flannel jacket and a baseball hat and a plain white car. Just a plain white vehicle. Just a four-door car. That was it, you know? And um, and it's incredible. If a white woman was to accuse, you know, uh, um, you know Anna, Anna Bardwell, right? She had accused... I want to get these names right because these are important cases. William Tyler. So William Tyler uh, um, was said to have raped Anna Campbell in Nicholas County. So William Tyler was said to have raped Anna Campbell. They he said that he didn't do it, and uh, the father said, "Well, you know, my daughter said that she did, so therefore you're going to die." And that's you know that's. Um, that's ridiculous and that's total bullshit. So that's uh, just wanted to clear that up about C.J. Miller and uh, in that case, okay? Because I kind of mixed a couple of them. Now the the children's book that I'm in, uh, talking about now is the Little Prince, okay? The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint Exupery. It was written in 1943, and this is a Frenchman that had written it, and it's a short read. It's only about 107 pages. It goes by really fast, um, and it was actually given to me by my lesbian aunt. My lesbian aunt gave me this book when I was real young. She also gave me a little teddy bear when I was real young, too, but um, it, she, she forgot what it actually was in, contained in this book because if she had remembered what was contained in it, then she would know that the... Uh, uh, you know, basically all the lessons is against everything that, that she does and that she is. Uh, the, there's a lot of lessons in here about life and love and what's important and matters of consequence and also kind of the children, the, the naive, the, the, how children are sort of naive, but at the same time they possess a genius uh, that the adults completely miss out on. And there's a lot of adults that are real stupid in here, okay? So, um, all grown-ups were once children, but only few of them remember it. So that's a quote from this. So basically, this also sort of says about Kentucky. Kentucky has all these problems, number one in pollution and poverty, and they have the number one for cancer, and just all these horrible, horrible statistics about them. And, um, uh, and uh, the biggest one is literacy that I want to point out, and sort of the education one. The adults, two out of five Kentuckians can't read, or they got a... Um, under a kindergarten reading level, okay, so they can barely even read, if they can even read, two out of five, and that's a, a whopping 40%, whopping 40%, you think that has something to do with the all the stupid behavior that we're seeing? Of course it does, of course it does, just recently they had a daycare that was busted for heroin, 
And why did that happen? Well, you know, that there's it's kind of a stupid culture. Um, I don't want to go too much into the details of that, but um, it's a stupid culture. It's a stupid culture, okay? And prohibition has never worked. That's what we learned with the alcohol prohibition. Uh, we're attacking the supplies as if we can remove the uh, drugs out of the uh, 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 out of America. You know, I guess destroy all these drugs, but that has never worked. And nobody goes after the demand. Why do people feel the need that they have to do heroin or meth? or crocodile or any of these horrible drugs you know crocodile like or meth just destroys your face and kind of rots your teeth out and then crocodile just fucking deteriorates your arm and just you know um you just fucking fall apart why would anybody do something like that is i think it's even made with gasoline so um the the adults two out of four two out of five of them can't even read and then you have the children who are like the tenth smartest in all the country two years in a row kentucky kids have ranked tenth highest in the nation and that actually is a remarkable statistic because Kentucky has been raking on the bottom for as long as I can remember and probably way before then I mean I'm 32 years old so I've been on this planet for you know over three decades and we've always been 49th 48th you know just basically on the bottom of the barrel uh, when it comes to uh, education but our youngsters our young people in spite of the lack of funding for education they are 10th in the nation they are the 10th smartest kids in the nation so our next generation are more evolved they're more technologically astute and they're literate and they're, they're smarter than the adults so we really need to empower our youth because they're a smart generation uh, so, The Little Prince was written in 1943 by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I already said this, but let's see. Oh, yeah, in the very beginning, he draws, like, this boa constrictor, and uh, it swallowed an, an elephant, right? And, and here's the picture, and they said, the adults all said, oh, that looks like a hat. Oh, that's a hat right there, you know? And so, he, he's basically, he was like... Um, that's not a hat, but you had to explain it to him, and he didn't want to ex go around explaining to him all the time. And so then he drew this picture, which shows the elephant inside the bow constrictor, but then it kind of ruins the picture because that's not actually what it would look like if a snake swallowed an elephant. So he said the grown-up's response this time was to advise me to lay aside my drones of the bow constrictors, whether from the inside or the outside, and devote myself instead to geography, history, arithmetic, and grammar. That is why at the age of six I gave up what might have been a magnificent career as a painter. Uh, I had been disheartened by the failure of my drawing number one and my drawing number two. Grown-ups never understand anything by themselves and it's tiresome for children to always be uh, and forever explaining things to them. When the little prince hops from planet to planet, he meets, meets lots of typical adults, and he doesn't understand a single thing about them. And there's, uh, I recognize these adults too, and they're, they're really stupid, okay? There's a king, right, who just wants to put his authority on everybody. It kind of reminds me of, like, just somebody who's, uh, who gets up and does something. Oh, yeah, Kristen Harris from Spalding University, she did this. The, um, she ordered everybody arbitrarily just to kind of, uh, uh get, get up from the seats they were sitting at and then just be all bunched up in a tiny little, uh, group in a tiny little pack for no apparent reason. And, um, and I had, didn't want to do that and I didn't like the tone of her voice. So instead of complying with her wishes, I stood up and I walked out and she said, and I was going to just use the bathroom and come back. And then she's like, hey, you need to know this. This stuff is important. And I was like, oh, I can't use the bathroom. And then she's like, okay, I'll let you use the bathroom. Right, right. Because her permission is what I needed because she's a king. She has to dominate everybody and it has to be through her permission. There's a conceited man who thinks everybody is just supposed to admire him. He doesn't really listen to anything except for praise and he expects the little prince to praise him and admire him. There's the tippler, a drunk, right? He's a, a, he's He drinks because he's ashamed and he's ashamed to drink and, and so that's why he drinks. There's a businessman who just sits there and counts all the stars in the sky and he says that he owns a star since he's the first person to think of that and um, even though the businessman uh, there is no use uh, to the uh, is of no use to the stars there's also a lamp lighter in, on asteroid 329 right he's um, it's a little prince so it's magical he lives on a far away asteroid and he hops from one asteroid to another asteroid to another asteroid then eventually lands on planet earth uh, he actually leaves his rose he had a flower that he had left on his planet 
So the lamp lighter uh, was on asteroid 323, and he just lights and he puts out the lamp light. Um, and the lamp lighter thinks it's a terrible profession because he has to light the lamp and then put the lamp out every time because those are the orders. Those are the orders. Every time uh, daylight happens, he has to put it out and start it again. Uh, even though he's sort of naive and stupid, right, just by following orders and just doing this simple thing or ridiculous thing, uh, the little prince recognized that at least the lamp lighter had some purpose to the lamp. You know, he, he turned it on, then he turned it off. And, uh, and so he understood him, but he didn't understand the other adults. And then we got the geographer. And I'm going to read each one of those, actually, uh, just real quickly through each one of those. Um, the geographer also has some issues with him, too, so...